anybody you want. You know, I had engineers from Stanford working for me building stuff. I don't have to do it. I just don't build it like that. You know. So it's very important. And when you're starting out, you see your weaknesses and you think, uh oh, you know, I'm not gonna make it in this because I can't do this. There are certain things you absolutely have to do to succeed. Coming up with ideas, thinking critically is vital. Thinking critically is vital. I could do that very well as well. You know, anybody who gives a lecture, whether it's me or anybody else, you should think critically about what that person is saying. And I could do that really well. I'll give, I'll give you an example. I was a graduate, and I was a postdoc at, at UCLA at Brain Research Institute. And they brought in a guy from, from a big time guy, you know, uh, National Academy from Harvard to give a lecture. And I was like, first year post, I was 24 years old. And this guy, I'll never forget this, was talking about these experiments that he was doing about whether or not there is some kind of primordial genetic recognition by species of predators. Do you understand what that means? In other words, what he was looking at, he went on an island in the Caribbean somewhere where these troop of monkeys were living. But these monkeys, many, many, many generations before, came from Africa. And they were running around there wild on the island. So he, had, he wanted to find out how would these monkeys react to a predator that they had in Africa, but they don't have there, they never saw there. So he took this stuff, these stuffed predators, like a lion, and exposed them to these monkeys to see what they do. Okay? And they went crazy. And so he, so he was saying, he said, well, you know, this shows you that even after 20 generations, it's still in the genome that they have this fear of the monkey, of this predator, you know, the lion or whatever it was. You know, everybody's like, so I go, you have a question? I said, yeah, what's the control here? I mean, do you ever show him a bear? You know, what? Why would I show him a bear? I said, you have no control. He goes, uh, let me, next slide. Okay. <laughs> the guy was stupid, you know. I mean, I mean, he, he was trying to prove something that there's no evidence for, but because he was a, you know, well-known professor, think critically. Because when, because what happens is, you know, I found, for example, uh, when I would get papers to review, or I would have grants to review, or give it to graduates, and say, hey, review that. Some of them couldn't do it. They would just say, yeah, it's not very good. Why isn't it very good? I don't know. It's not very good. That's not critical thinking. So you have to do that. You have to have ideas. And finally, this is probably very important, you have to learn how to write well. Most people, most people cannot write. They're terrible writers. I know, terrible writers. So, so you know, when I when I when I would write uh, papers or a grant, I'd go fifty. Writing is rewriting. I would write one paragraph fifty times, mm -hmm. write it over and over and over again. And sometimes, you know, I always put it away for three or four days. Look at it. Go, God, did I write this junk? This is terrible. <laughs> I mean, you know, like that. So if you could come up with ideas. Think critically and write well, you're going to succeed. There's no question about it. You're going to succeed anywhere in the world. And you know, and don't don't think you have to be perfect in everything, because there's nobody perfect in anything. Not even me. <laughs> so that's my long answer to your, to your short question. Yeah. You mentioned that it's important to consider the individual uh, specific of each person, and in most of the schools that doesn't happen. We have standard curriculum for everyone. So what would be your solution or your advice to potential parents? Yeah, tell them you heard this lecture and you should change it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, the fact of the matter is, you actually look, look, it's very hard to make change because it's based on what was done before and before and before and before. And, and I mean, you, you know, in the United States, it's the same way. Well, well you know, why do they do it? Well, they do it because they did it like that last year and the year before and so on. So to change anything, is a bureaucracy involved and so on. So the only places where you really get progressive education are small, in the United States, small, very expensive private schools. You know, we're paying $50,000 a year for a 10-year-old child to be educated. And then they have individual attention and each child is treated differently and so on. But the fact of the matter is uh, that it's very, very, very difficult for a teacher that has 30 or 40 kids in the classroom to give individual attention to kids, you know. Uh, uh, and and, I, and m my point here is that that has to be overcome in some way if you want to get optimal kind of learning. You know, it's just, just as uh, optimal performance from kids. It's just as simple as that. And different kids have different strengths. You know, uh, I, I mean, uh, 
it, it's, it's, it, and, and, and what's, what's terrible is that when a child at any age, whether college age or much younger, but younger is worse, fails at something because it's not being presented correctly to her or him, they feel it's a failure. And they, and they, and they consider themselves a failure. And, and, and as a result, it has a cycling back thing like that. But maybe under very different circumstances, it was presented in a setting that made sense, they would excel. And, and uh, you know, it's just one of those things that, that is a worldwide problem and it's very difficult to change. Uh, I was, you know, I went to a parochial school in New York City in Manhattan, and I was lucky that in like the fourth grade, I had a teacher that actually paid attention to the kids and had each kid do a special project. Uh, every kid, every kid in the class, like 30 kids, I think, you know, had a special project, and it was just amazing to see that. Uh, you know, I had a project where, where, where I did a, I still remember, I did a thing on this solar system. I made drawings of that, I drew things and stuff, and, and, and somebody else did a thing about growing plants and things. That was like an eye-opener to me, because everything else was standard stuff. And so it's very difficult to change. Yeah. Thank you very much for your comprehensive this overview. My question relates to language and genetic. So what is the links between ethnicity and primary language you are learning? There's opinion that Japanese, if first learn English and after return to use Japanese, so his effectiveness and style of thinking could see will be radically different than in opposite. He will start from his native language. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't have expertise in that to answer that, but, but there is, you know, the, the, there are a lot of data that the, the, the ethnic background of the individual uh, and the way they learn language is, you know, uh, what you just said, will have an impact on the person's later creativity and things of that sort. You know, so, so um, for a long time, uh, the, the, uh, the Japanese, and I, I go to Japan every year for a meeting for many years now, uh, were concerned about the fact that they, their creativity was stifled because of things like how the language has been learned and so on. And that turned out to be not true because the Japanese guys who went to the United States or to Europe, some of them ended up winning Nobel Prizes. So it wasn't the early language learning, it was the system they had in Japan after they got into the higher levels. And I'll give you an example, just so you'll appreciate this. So I was, I was um, many years ago, I was in Osaka University working with a very famous guy in my field. And I was there for a month. And uh, one day, uh, the, the young people in the department, they were associate professors, but they were really like postdocs, okay? Associate professors, about five, six of them, took me out for, um, for sake and yakitori. Uh, and so we were out uh, in, in this restaurant for a long time, you know, drinking a lot and so on. And after a lot of drinks, I said, let me ask you guys a question. And by the way, these guys were trained at, one guy was at Harvard, one guy came from MIT, one guy came from Berkeley. They were the top places they were trained. So they, so they were in the American system. They came back to Japan to join this professor's department. And I said, let me ask you a question. And professor Simoto had a idea for a project. And you knew, you absolutely knew that this project could not work. You're absolutely convinced. Uh, would you still do it, or would you tell them, I'm sorry, I don't think this project would work? Every one of them said, we'd still do it. That's the problem. The hierarchical system, okay? In the U.S., I don't know how it is here, but you had this experience, you know, an undergraduate in the lab will say, uh, you know what, I don't think that's the, telling him to do an experiment. Yeah, I don't think that experiment will work. They're telling me, I'm a distinguished professor of neurobiology. I don't think it's going to work, you know? Most of the time, that kid doesn't know what he's talking about. But every once in a while, you go, hmm. Let me think about that, okay? So this lack of a hierarchy, and, that, and that's not due to the language learning per se, is the culture. And Japan has changed a lot in that way. Uh, they're bringing more women into, into, into the academic thing, and as a result, uh, they've won several Nobel Prize winners. They've had several Nobel Prize in Japan, like that. Yeah. Uh, sir? Two questions. One is more global. You know that the phenomenon of EG, yes? This is the potential which we can register from the surface of it. Yeah, Berger. Berger in Germany discovered it yes. in the 20s. Yes, yes. Uh, what about your opinion? Is it just a phenomenon, or this potential can regulate the activity of some uh, part of the brains in the time? This is 
first question. And the second is about audiovisual stimulation or uh, enrichment of the environment stimulus, stimuli. Yes? Uh, how it's uh, impact to learning or, or changing the situation of the brain. Yeah, okay. So for those of you, so the first question was about something called EEG, also called brain waves. Yes. Okay. So so these are recordings. They've been around since the 1920s. I've, I've done recordings. I've done recordings on these. And you put these scalp electrodes on, and uh, you turn on an amplifier, and what you see is you see these brain waves coming, and they're characterized by different frequencies and different amplitudes. So there's like alpha wave, you know, there's beta waves, gamma waves, and so on. And to a large degree, they reflect the kind of state you're in. So if you're if you're kind of relaxed, you know, just sort of chilling out, you might you're mainly in kind of alpha wave, okay? Now if I come behind you and I go, you go into a beta wave like that. And and there are others, you know, they 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 they'll use a lot in sleep research. Uh, so so it, it it gave us indication that there are four stages of sleep. There's some uh, when dreaming occurs, we know now as a result of that some. So yes, they reflect brain states for sure. And what's interesting is people have, have been able to train themselves so they can generate different brain waves, biofeedback, it's called biofeedback. And uh, a number of people have been interested in using these brain waves to control machinery and stuff. So in the United States, there's an agency called DARPA. DARPA is the agency responsible for the internet in the world. They first started the military use. And many years before that, I had a good friend of mine uh, who came out of the same postdoc lab as I did. And when he, he got his own lab, DARPA gave him a long time ago a lot of money so to see whether he could get jet pilots to use brain waves to fly jets. You know, way out of his time. I hope they're not doing that <laughs> on the flight back to uh, the US and stuff. So I don't know how it worked out. So yeah, EEG is a real thing. It's not an epiphenomenon. It's been around for a long time. And by the way, it's the it's the final sign of death. So when your when your EEG is flat, it means the brain is dead. You're dead. Even the heart can still be beating. So you know.